Hello, and uh, welcome to the next episode of uh, Learning and Behavior. This is going to be a bit of a nerdy episode, but uh, I hope uh, I, I can convince you that it's highly relevant to your everyday life and experience. Uh, we're going to talk about the role of Pavlovian learning in instrumental conditioning. So far, we've been talking about Pavlovian conditioning and instrumental conditioning as if these are completely different things and as if these things can be uh, clearly separated. And uh, that's true to some extent with Pavlovian conditioning. That is, you can rig or design a Pavlovian procedure so it doesn't have any instrumental components. But it doesn't work the other way around. It's impossible to design an instrumental conditioning procedure that does not have any Pavlovian components. Uh, and these Pavlovian components turn out to be pretty important in instrumental behavior. They are responsible for what we refer to as incentive motivation. That is, incentive motivation is activation of the memory of the reinforcer. And if you think about the reinforcer, that sometimes energizes you to uh, make the instrumental responses that are necessary to actually obtain the reinforcer. So <clears throat> to get into this, uh, let's look at the first slide. And uh, this presents uh, uh, the three components uh, of an instrumental conditioning situation that Thorndike originally identified. Uh, these are three components that occur universally in every instrumental conditioning situation. Uh, in the middle, obviously, you've got the instrumental response, but that response occurs in the presence of certain cues represented here by the capital S. And once the response is made, that results in the delivery of the reinforcer or the response outcome, capital O. So we've got three elements. And it turns out these three elements can be combined or there are various associations that can be established among these three elements. We've talked about the SR association. That's one of them. That's the Thorndike's law of effect. Uh, the, uh, there's also an association that can become established between uh, stimuli S and the reinforcer, the SO association. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about that today. Uh, there is a possible association between the response and the reinforcer, the RO association. And then there is a rather complicated hierarchical association whereby the stimulus S comes to activate the RO association. Now, if you, uh, the main point to uh, take away from this is that uh, instrumental conditioning involves multiple associations. There is evidence for every one of these associations. So instrumental conditioning is multiply determined. There is no one factor that drives the whole system. So in... Uh, the remaining uh, uh, part of this uh, discussion, we're going to focus on the SO association, uh, which is highlighted in the next slide. So what is the SO association? Well, the, it's uh, because the subject receives the reinforcer, having made the response in the presence of these cues S, uh, there is the possibility and, and uh, certainty, actually, that S is going to be associated with the reinforcer. This is a purely Pavlovian association. S acts as kind of a condition, st uh, condition stimulus. O is uh, the reinforcer, acts as an unconditioned stimulus. And so the SO association is basically a Pavlovian association that's embedded in an, and is learned as a consequence of an instrumental conditioning procedure. And the result of that is when you're put in the presence of stimuli S, you come to expect the reinforcer O. So S activates the memory of O. And uh, this is the basis for what we refer to as incentive motivation. So if, uh, if this story holds, we're going to need, we'll need to provide evidence for the existence of Pavlovian learning in instrumental conditioning situations. And what would be the nature of that, that evidence? What kind of evidence can we collect? The next slide shows you uh, the main sources of evidence for Pavlovian processes in instrumental conditioning 
situation. So we set up an instrumental conditioning procedure and then look for these Pavlovian things. Well, the first uh, uh, form of evidence is you can actually see Pavlovian CRs in an instrumental conditioning situation. So if you train a rat, for example, to run down an alley, uh, the rat will start to salivate as it gets close to the gold box. <laughs> Uh, so uh, you get salivary conditioning in instrumental uh, training involving food as a reinforcer. Uh, there are complications with that kind of evidence, and so I'm not going to actually present a specific experiment. By far, the the um, most uh, the preponderance of evidence about the role of and the impact of Pavlovian learning on instrumental behavior comes from something that's called the Pavlovian instrumental transfer experiment and uh, that's kind of a mouthful and i apologize and there's no way to <laughs> sugarcoat it but neuroscientists in particular have been really interested in pavlovian instrumental transfer uh, designs experimental designs as a way of studying the role of incentive motivation in instrumental behavior so what's a pavlovian instrumental transfer experiment well, this involves several stages as illustrated in the next slide. So we have a phase of instrumental conditioning, which you know, rat pressing a bar for food, uh, pretty straightforward, nothing fancy about that. Then we have an, a separate phase in which we just do Pavlovian conditioning, where we present a CS followed by uh, uh, the food so that the CS comes to activate the reward expect expectancy. And then uh, in order to evaluate how this reward expectancy influences instrumental behavior, uh, we include this transfer phase. And then during the transfer phase, the animal is put back in a situation where it's pressing a bar for food. And periodically we present the uh, Pavlovian CS and see what happens to the rate of lever pressing for food. So that's a Pavlovian instrumental transfer kind of experiment. And the next slide shows a specific example of that. So we train lever pressing for food. Uh, in this situation, the food expectancy is elicited by situational cues by the rat being in that experimental chamber. Then we take the lever out, we present a tone followed by food sufficiently sufficient number of times so you get a strong association the lever is not there the animal doesn't have to press the lever to get the food during this pavlovian phase that's pure pavlovian conditioning and then we look to see what is the effect of activating this uh, food expectancy by presenting the tone while the subject is uh, has a chance to press the lever for food and uh, what we see is that the rate of lever pressing increases. So this is a, an example of a Pavlovian instrumental uh, uh, experimental design in which uh, the underlying expectancy that's acquired or learned during the course of instrumental conditioning, that is the expectation that food will occur, is compatible with the expectation that's elicited by, by the Pavlovian condition stimulus, the tone. And if um, there are compatible expectancies of that sort, the typical outcome is that uh, if you present the tone, the rate of lever pressing increases. And the typical interpretation would be that this demonstrates that uh, incent uh, activating the incentive for food reward uh, actually energizes uh, the instrumental response. There is another form of uh, Pavlovian instrumental transfer experiment, which is illustrated in the next slide, in which uh, the uh, reward expectancy that's uh, learned during instrumental conditioning is not compatible with the expectancy that's trained during the Pavlovian phase. And you get a very different result under these circumstances. So in this Pavlovian instrumental transfer experiment, animals are first trained to lever press for food so, such that when they're put in the box with the lever, 
uh, they come to expect and that activates the memory of food. And uh, so food expectancy is elicited by situational cues. Then you take the lever out and you do pure Pavlovian conditioning. Tone is followed by shock in this case. Well, so the tone comes to activate uh, the memory of an aversive event rather than an appetitive or desirable event. So that expectation is incompatible with uh, the expectancy of food. How does this affect uh, the rate of instrumental behavior. Well, we do the transfer test at the end where uh, the animals are back, lever pressing for food, and now we present the tone periodically. And what we find is that the presentation of the tone is going to suppress lever pressing for food. So uh, if the uh, expectancies established in instrumental conditioning in the Pavlovian phase are incompatible, you get a decrease in instrumental behavior. Well, there have been a large number of uh, these kinds of uh, Pavlovian instrumental transfer experiments. We talked about two categories. Uh, you can also do inhibitory training uh, as a Pavlovian uh, conditioning phase, uh, or uh, either with appetitive reinforcers like food or with aversive stimuli like shock, and uh, look to see how conditioned inhibitors that are established in a Pavlovian phase influence lever pressing for food or lever pressing for shock avoidance. So if you put all these combinations together, there are lots of different forms of Pavlovian instrumental transfer, and uh, this represents a large uh, body of uh, research, a very rich area of investigation. And neuroscientists are, are now uh, using all of these paradigms in order to examine how various kinds of uh, incentives that are activated by Pavlovian stimuli are going to influence uh, instrumental behavior that either is compatible or incompatible uh, with the uh, incentive that is uh, activated by uh, the Pavlovian CS. Okay, so that, all of that's a mouthful. <laughs> and as I said, this was going to be kind of a nerdy, pretty nerdy sort of uh, video. And you might ask yourself, well, what does this have to do with me? <laughs> well, uh, this, it turns out this has a lot to do with... Um, all kinds of, well, it's relevant in, in, in all instrumental conditioning situations. It's uh, certainly relevant uh, in relapse from uh, uh, the treatment for drug addiction. You know, what causes relapse uh, a, for someone who's been treated for, with drug addiction? Well, what causes relapse is uh, if the person is uh, 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 go, walks into a bar and smells alcohol and stimuli associated, previously associated with the consumption of alcohol. Uh, uh, that essentially is an SO association. Those stimuli activate the memory of alcohol, which then uh, energizes the instrumental behavior. What's the instrumental behavior? Well, the instrumental behavior there is to actually order, order a drink and, uh, and, dr and drink it. Uh, another area... Uh, it turns out where uh, these Pavlovian instrumental transfer effects are hugely uh, relevant and they kind of drive the whole system is in advertising. So uh, in advertising, what's what's the goal? Well, you have a product like, uh, you know, Starbucks coffee <laughs> and uh, you want people to have positive associations with Starbucks coffee. And so the ads for Starbucks coffee shows people who are happy and satisfied and so on. Uh, and uh, that's essentially a Pavlovian conditioning kind of uh, process. It's a Pavlovian conditioning phase that uh, enhances the attractiveness of a particular brand or particular item. And what's the point of enhancing uh, the attractiveness of the brand? Well, Starbucks can be highly attractive, <laughs> you know, but it doesn't make the company any money unless somebody actually goes into the Starbucks and purchases the cup of coffee. Well, going into the store and purchasing the cup of coffee, those are instrumental responses. 
And so uh, what advertisers are uh, uh, assuming is that the, these Pavlovian associations are going to uh, serve to activate uh, the incentive of the how wonderful it is to drink a cup of coffee, the aroma and the taste and how you feel and so forth, and then perhaps the people that you enjoy the drink with, and uh, uh, activating uh, that reward expectancy will then energize your instrumental behavior of going into the store, actually ordering ordering the drink and paying for it. And the, the instrumental behavior is going to purchase the product. And uh, if uh, Pavlovian mechanisms were independent of instrumental behavior, then activating these incentives would not result in you're actually purchasing the product. So and the reason advertising works is because of the role of Pavlovian mechanisms in the control of instrumental behavior. So I hope I've convinced you that that's pretty important. And it's just as important when uh, you're cooking dinner or doing any other kind of uh, instrumental a action. You know, you walk in and you smell something or you think about, oh, it, how great it would be to eat lasagna today. <laughs> well, uh, that's the incentive, but that doesn't get you anywhere until you actually go to the cupboard and make the lasagna or you, you know, take it out of the freezer and you defrost it and so forth. So there's a lot of instrumental behavior that has to be active, uh, energized by the, uh, the, that kind of incentive motivation. And how all that works is all about Pavlovian instrumental transfer phenomenon. And that's my story for today. And uh, I'm not going to make any money on this, but Starbucks is. <laughs> so see you next time. Stay safe.